All right, well, let's start off and pray, and we'll get started. Yahweh, thank you so much for uh, just what you're teaching us and your word, Lord. We thank you for the Passover season, Pesach. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you, you left uh, this earth to come, and, and you left the heavens, God, to come and be with us on this earth and to teach us what it's like to live a holy lifestyle, God, to teach us your ways, your commandments, and your statutes. Father, I pray that you would speak through me, your servant tonight. And that the things that you want to talk about through Passover, Lord, would be your words, not mine. That you penetrate the hearts of your people and draw them in a deeper covenant with you. Father, I pray that you would show us, even through the basic elementary things of your word, Lord, that you would prick our hearts to dive deeper into who you are. And everyone said, amen. amen. All right, well, let's begin. As they put my, my uh, PowerPoint up on the screen, tonight is going to be called All About Passover. We're going to talk about the historical account of Passover. We're going to talk about whom was it given to. We're going to talk about the message that's hidden in the details. We're going to go over some amazing details of Passover and some of the messages that are found in there. We're also going to talk about the gospel account, that the gospel is actually built into the Passover itself. And we're going to talk about the value of celebrating today. Most of us in this room are watching this online or on DVD we have never grown up. We did not grow up celebrating Passover. We, ce we grew up celebrating Easter and the celebrating of the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday. And, but in ancient times, this is what they did. They celebrated Passover. And so we're going to find out what did our ancestors do? What did our, what the disciples do? What the apostles do? What did all the first century believers and second century and third century believers celebrate? We're going to dive into this issue or this topic called the Passover. Let's talk about the original plan first in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. Some of you are going to learn a really important Hebrew word tonight. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now for years, ever since, since I was a believer and, and read this, for years I read this exactly the way the English seems to say it, which is for seasons. Spring, summer, winter, and fall. But the reality is there was no spring, summer, winter, and fall in Genesis. It, God created the earth perfect. And what state was the earth in? The state of Hawaii. That's what state it was in. Okay? So if you've ever been to there, I, I made that up on a fly. Isn't that amazing? No, I'm just kidding. The, the state of Hawaii, it was a tropical rainforest. It was an amazing, it was a Jurassic experience, if you will. That was what the season was. So in English, the season doesn't give us the right word. The word in Hebrew there is moedim. And what does moedim mean? Moedim in, in Hebrew means this. Properly, an appointment. That is a fixed time or a season. Specifically, a festival. By implication, an assembly. A convened for definite purpose. Technically, the congregation, by extension, the place of meeting. What? So in Genesis, God creates the sun, moon, the stars for seasons, for days, times, and see, for, for an appointment for his church. That's what it means. It's an appointment. How many of you have an appointment book out there? Okay, I mean, I, I can't even, there's no way I could exist without my you know, appointment calendar. And if I miss an appointment, someone's not going to be happy. I have to hit my appointments. God says he has an appointment book. He, and his calendar is the one that he goes by. And so how many of you know that if your anniversary uh, for your wedding day is on, let's say, July 4th, because that's one of my favorite holidays in the entire world is fireworks. And, and so it's, luckily we have one in the United States or I'd have to make up my own. But on July 4th, let's say that you had your own set of fireworks and it was your wedding anniversary. Well, imagine if you decided, you know what, I don't want to go by the Gregorian calendar. I'm going to go by the Julian calendar, you know, because, you know, I just don't agree with the change that they did all, all those centuries ago. Well, you can say that all day long, but if your wife is going by the Gregorian calendar, she's looking at July 4th, and you better have something there to remind her that you remembered. Because if you're, it doesn't matter if you say, well, you know, it's only two days difference. Your wife is not going to care what your excuse is. It better be on the day because anniversaries are important. Amen? Times and dates are important. God has a calendar that he goes by, and I call it God's prophetic calendar, and those dates that he puts on there, he is looking for his people to remember that because you are his bride. 
This is all about a marriage ceremony. This is all about the rehearsals. So that God's prophetic calendar or the feast days of the Bible are simply wedding rehearsals. That's all they are. Now you can say, well, I don't need a rehearsal. And you may not. If you want to show up on your wedding day without a rehearsal, that's your call. But I advise everyone that I counsel, you probably should have a wedding rehearsal. Or it could be very humbling on the day of the wedding. God created these holy days exactly for that. Also, it goes on to say, that's not even enough. It says, also, it's a signal. It's an appointment beforehand. Appointed, sign, time, a place of solemn assembly, a congregation. The word can even mean congregation. Why? Because it's a holy convocation. That is that word in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. So let's go through some common myths, and we're going to remove those myths tonight. First of all, the Passover is a Jewish holiday. That's a myth. The only reason, by the way, why most people believe that it's Jewish is because they're the only ones that keep it. If the Muslims were the only ones that kept it, people would say it's a Muslim holiday. You see how our logic works? We don't actually call things for what they are. We call them by what society says that they are. Okay? Number two, New Testament believers didn't keep the Passover or the other feasts. We're going to talk about that, find out if that's true. Number three, Passover has been, quote, fulfilled, so we don't need to keep it anymore. We're going to talk about that, discover how much truth is that. First, we're going to start off with this. Passover is Jewish. That's myth number one that we want to dispel. We're going to go back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, to get our answer. And thus you shall eat with it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste, for it is whose Passover? It is the Jewish Passover. Oh, I read it wrong. I'm sorry. No, it says it's the Lord's Passover. This is literally one of the only things on his calendar. He says, you can't own. I don't want anybody owning this. He says, this is my Passover. And so we may take it very uh, personal. We may uh, enjoy the feast and we may uh, totally take part in God's calendar, but this is his wedding day. And he wants you to know you're invited. But these are his. Okay, so let's just get that right off the bat. These are not Jewish feast days. These are God's feast days. And, by the way, how many tribes were at the base of Mount Sinai when this was given? There were 12 tribes. All of the children of Israel were there. And the Jewish people were only the two southern tribes called the House of Judah. That's where the word Jewish came from, was the Judites. And so they had not even developed that name yet. So when God gave his Passover uh, to us for stewardship, it was all of Israel. Okay? And so those that are commanded to keep the feast are the children of God. So if you consider yourself a child of God, this is your anniversary. Let's talk about the disciples and the Passover. Find out if they celebrated it. We'll do the, turn to Luke twenty two nineteen 19 to discover the beginning of that answer. And he took bread, gave thanks, this is the famous quote right here, and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Okay, now this is not a Passover meal that he's celebrating, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but this is the night before Passover and they consider this whole thing the season of Passover, okay? And so we've got the disciples we know took part in in the Passover. And by the way, they did it after he died. So if we take the traditional mindset that's in Christianity that celebrating Passover is legalistic, then we literally have to say that the disciples were caught in legalism their whole life after Jesus died. They continued to celebrate the feast days. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 5.8, it's a dead giveaway. The Apostle Paul says in a very strong wordage, he says, therefore, let us keep the feast, talking about the feast of Passover, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he draws an analogy there that leavened bread is, uh, is sin, okay, uh, or not truth and wickedness, but the unleavened bread is sincerity and truth. So he's literally given a commandment to the first century believers that we need to keep the feast, just not in the old way, 
in the new way, in light of Messiah, in sincerity and truth. Paul, in Acts chapter 18, verse 20, we get into his heart a little bit, in his mind. He says, when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent. Why? But took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus. It, do you realize that, that getting from Ephesus to uh, Jerusalem was not an easy task back then? You didn't just, you know, hop on American Airlines and get a little puddle jumper, you know, over to Jerusalem and land in Tel Aviv and say, here I is, I'm ready, I'm the Apostle Paul. This was a big deal. So for Paul, I mean, most of us, let's just be honest, if it's too difficult, us American Israelites, we're just like, you know, I'll just, you know, watch on the live stream. I'll just, I'll just catch it later. I'll do this. I'll do that. We always make excuses for ourselves. If anybody had the right to make an excuse not to go to Jerusalem for the feast, it's Paul because it's a major ordeal. How many of you would seriously sail, you know, anything, a much le- you know, a pond, much less, you know, half of the ocean to get over to where he needed to be. That's his desire in his heart was to celebrate the feast with his people in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 20, it just continues, verse 16, for Paul has decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, for the feast of Shavuot. So now we're 50 days past Passover, and he we have a continued. This is over a decade later, ladies and gentlemen, maybe 15 years after Yeshua has died, after the Messiah Jesus has died, he is still has a heart to celebrate the feast days. And I can assure you that apparently he did not get the memo that they were done away with. He doesn't check email because he's out too much ministering to God's people. Passover has been fulfilled. One of the most misunderstood, uh, misunderstood phrases in the entire Bible is this Greek word fulfilled. So uh, some of this for some of you is going to be training for how to share this with others. And this is the verse, this is the, the scripture, this is the word that you need to know and memorize so that you can explain this because this is the number one uh, scripture that most often comes up when I talk to people is that you know God, God's law or his, his feast days have been fulfilled. So let's find out what this word actually means and not what society says it means. So I want to ask the question, does fulfill mean to make done away with? Does it mean to be done away with? Well, we're going to dig into a couple. Did Yeshua fulfill all love while he was here on earth? Would you agree? Yeshua fulfilled all love. He absolutely filled it up. Does that mean that love is done away with? Absolutely not. He fulfilled all of the commandments, no doubt about it. If he fulfilled every one of them, think of the logic. If, he, if the definition of fulfill is to, is to be done away with, then that means we literally have to do away with everything. That would make us a lawless society. We can't pick and choose. So let's talk about what it means. The, he, the Greek word here is pleru. Everybody say pleru. There you go. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. This is the scripture that I used to even bring up to say that God's law has been done away with. Right here it says he came to fulfill it because society told me that's what it meant. It says, for surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one single word, not a jot or tittle will pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. So this is the the, the scripture that's being used, but let's look what it actually says in different scriptures, and let's apply the same rule of being done away with in other scriptures. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. So just two chapters earlier, we get this. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill, uh, pleru, all righteousness. So if we use the same logic then we are literally saying that Yeshua did away with all righteousness. Does that make sense? Because if he fulfilled it, and fulfilled it to be done away, then he's doing away with all righteousness. And I don't know a single theologian out there that would say that righteousness has been done away with just because Yeshua came. It would be the opposite. He brought righteousness to his bride and clothed her with it. So now going back to Matthew chapter 5, let's finish that last section 
Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men also, talking about the Torah, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so he settles the debate right there in Matthew chapter 5 by saying, I did not come to uh, do away or to abolish my law, my word. I came to fulfill it. What does the word fulfill mean? It means to fill up. The Greek word pleru means to fill up to full completion of the original master's purpose. Which means that if you were making chocolate chip cookies, let's say, I'm a big chocolate chip cookie fan. When my kids want to make chocolate chip cookies, they always come to me first. Dad, can we make chocolate chip cookies? Because they know what the answer is going to be. As mom goes, no. And I go, go make chocolate chip cookies. But what if you made chocolate chip cookies and you were only missing one single ingredient? The chocolate chips. That would be the worst chocolate chip cookie experience ever for a guy like me who, who, who could live off of chocolate chip cookies, especially warm out of the oven, right? Imagine you got your glass of milk there. How many of you can't, you're tracking with me on this. You're getting hungry. You can't eat chocolate chip cookies without a glass of milk. It's not possible. You got your glass of milk there, and you go to bite into that chocolate chip cookie. You close your eyes. It's hot and steamy, and it's no chocolate. That is the Torah with no Yeshua. It's not full. It's not complete. All of the recipe is there. Matter of fact, in the recipe, the Torah, it speaks of every ingredient. For it to be perfect and complete. And it says that everything is perfect. My word is perfect. But there's one missing ingredient. And that is my son. I'm going to send him. And so this is what he's saying. Is that I didn't come to abolish. I came to fulfill. To complete. Make perfect that which is from the beginning. Make sense? All right, let's continue. So why do we celebrate Easter instead of Passover? This is a big question. Why do we celebrate Easter instead of Passover? Well, let's discover this. We got some quotes here for some old guys. All right, Polycrates of Ephesus, 196 AD, the ninth bishop since Yeshua. Okay, this is really, really important because this is on the line. You know who the first one was? James. Brother of Jesus, all right? So this is, this is the importance of, the, of this line, this lineage of bishops, is that they're coming straight down. So we're nine generations now removed from Yeshua. And this is what he says in 196, we're not even 200 AD yet. We observe the genuine day, neither adding thereto nor taking there away from. All of these, the disciples it's talking about, observe the 14th day of Passover according to the gospel. The gospel? Wait a minute, the gospel? What's the gospel have anything to do with Passover? Everything. And they knew it. That's why he used gospel and he didn't say according to the word. Deviating in no respect but following the rule of faith. Do you hear the power of what's going on in these disciples' mind? They are considering the word of God, the law of commandment, the gospel, and they're considering following it, the rules called the rule of faith. Do you see the difference between American Christianity and first century Christianity is they considered following God faith. That if God said to do something, they did it, and that was called faith. Because in the Hebrew mindset, faith is not declaring that I love God. Faith is not saying I'm you know, going to do God's word. Faith is doing. Faith shuts its mouth and proves its love. Husbands, you can tell your wives all day long you love them. It doesn't mean a whole lot if you don't back it up with something. And that substance is your word. This is why James said, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. Because you Greeks don't get faith. Faith is doing. Faith is standing backwards on a platform and falling into someone's hands, trusting that they're going to catch me. Faith is not preaching about how they can catch me. Oh yeah, we, we trust one another, right? 
Council of Nicaea ruling 325 AD, here it is. When the question relative to the sacred festival of Easter, talking about Passover, arose, whether it should be Passover, Easter, and all this, it was universally thought that it would be, listen to this, convenient, I'm quoting, that all should keep the feast on one day. It was declared to be particularly unworthy for this, the holiest of all festivals, to follow the custom, the calculation of the Jews, who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes and whose minds were blinded. So the anti-Semitic feelings of the church fathers, quote-unquote, the Constantinian rule of thought in this, this council was that the Jews were soiled because they killed the Messiah. Therefore, no way are we going to celebrate Passover or the resurrection of our Lord on the day that they do it. Which, by the way, is the day the Bible says to do it. They made a major mistake in association. In other words, how many have heard the phrase, you know, don't shoot the messenger? Right? What does that mean? It means that it doesn't matter if instruction comes from a donkey or your enemy. You should always look at what they're saying, not who it's coming from. Because most times, God is real creative and loves to send you messages that you're probably not even going to catch. You know why? Because your pride is so thick that you won't hear that a lot of times he'll send messages from the very people you would never expect to hear the message from. God loves to send his hidden messages. Now, you might say that's not fair. Why does he always send hidden messages? Because he, there is a universal principle that he gave that says, I do not reveal myself to anyone except those who seek me. Because there's no other way, ladies and gentlemen, to prove who's on his team. Because he can, he can reveal now that that, that that is the rule. He, he can break his own rule anytime he wants and knock Paul off his horse. But Paul really truly thought he was serving God, believe it or not. And was doing the right thing. But most of the time, the rule is, is that he wants to see who's real. Who's going to seek me? Or who's going to go through their entire life and just play the game. And find out at the end of time that they don't even have a jersey to put on. Let's keep going. In rejecting their custom, it's not over yet. Which really was the Bible, it wasn't a custom. We may transmit to our descendants, that's you, the legitimate mode of celebrating Easter. We ought not to therefore have anything in common with the Jews, for the Savior has shown us another way. All the brethren in the East, catch this, who formerly celebrated Passover with the Jews will henceforth, from now on, keep it at the same time as the Romans. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the, the pinnacle direction change on the history timeline right here. This is just history. I'm not making this up. You can look it up for yourself. He's basically saying all of the believers in the East, which includes all of the churches that John and all the disciples started, that's who he's talking about, they all keep it according to the Jewish Bible, that old Bible thing. But we, from now on, and our descendants are going to follow it the way that I say to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, who ended up ruling the world? Rome. They make the rules because they have the gold. And we are simply the redheaded stepchildren of Catholicism. That's what Protestant is. They just fall right along in that, and did not do enough auditing to go back all the way to the very beginning. So that's when history was changed. What about communion? How many know that communion came from Passover? The Passover season, that Last Supper, is where the communion came from. Communion that we do today or what we most have done growing up in Christianity is simply a watered-down version of Catholicism. The whole wafer thing, how many, seriously, not trying to be funny, but I'm going to. I'm Jesus. I'm in the Last Supper. I'm breaking bread. The problem is, it's the size of a Tic Tac. <laughs> and I just don't know how I'm going to break it. And furthermore, I don't know how they're going to break it and pass it around. <laughs> and by the time it gets to John, who's sitting on the other side, it's a pebble. Thank you, Lord. 
you have a small body. (laughs) I don't think that that's what he's talking about when he broke bread. Ladies and gentlemen, they didn't crank bread out in the size of Tic Tacs. These were loaves of bread. The problem is is that uh, our Catholic uh, background has created a mass system of celebrating the Last Supper. And we're going to talk about tonight what that is supposed to look like. It's far different. Even growing up in non-denominational church after my Catholic background, we did the same thing. How many know what I'm talking about, right? It's just that it was a little bit bigger. You know, it was, it was, it was a, a cracker. At least it was, I had my own cracker. <laughs> and I never drank, but I was understood that what we received was even half of a regular shot glass. In, 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 in wine. So I had my own cracker and I had my own little glass of wine. And if you were really lucky and you were in a really nice church, it came already sealed. How many know what I'm talking about? You had to take off the seal. <sighs> fresh. Fresh from the grape vines of Welch's. <laughs> That is not what I call a feast. The Last Supper was not a Passover meal. So we're going to, we're going to give you just a couple things before we get into some, some deeper things. I just want to dispel this because I used to believe that it was, but it actually was not. It was not a Passover meal at all. It was the night before Passover. Matter of fact, uh, in my studies I found this, that there is a possibility of where the actual Passover Seder, uh, or the Passover, the Last Supper, excuse me, where it actually came from. And it's this concept, is graduation day. The word is seudat mitzvah. Everybody say that. Seudat mitzvah. Close enough. See, it all blends together. It's the banquet of completion. It's graduation day. What What is that? In the Mishnah, it talks about a banquet of graduation from a teaching of a tractate, okay? Or, and this actually can be a, a, a meal that's done during a wedding feast, uh, after a bar mitzvah. It was a celebration after an incredible event, or specifically uh, when a rabbi would finish teaching his Talmudim, his disciples, a significant lengthy lesson that may have taken months or weeks, they would have a celebration dinner. They're no different than us. I mean, they, we love to eat, and we're going to make up any way that we can to f- have a feast. They did the same thing, and it was called a seidat mitzvah. And this is pretty neat because there is an idea here of why did Yeshua, if this is not Passover night, why did they have this feast right before Passover? Because there's another thing you have to know that's very interesting in the Jewish culture of the first century. Uh, that if this exists in the first century, by the way, the Mishnah is about in the 200s, two, early 200s is when the oral traditions of the Jewish people were, were beginning to be written down. And so we're only a couple hundred years from Messiah, about 175 years from the time of the Last Supper. And so if this tradition existed 175 years earlier, this is going to make a whole lot of sense and it's pretty neat, is the night before Passover there was a called the fast of the firstborn. This makes perfect sense because what was the Passover all about? It was about the firstborn, freeing the firstborn, right? The passing over of the, uh, the death angel to free the firstborn. So the night before Passover, the Jews would fast, which makes perfect sense again because they're going to have a feast the next day. And so the night before, so on the 13th of of Eve, or the 13th of Nisan, they would fast. So if that tradition exists, why is Yeshua and the disciples having a feast? It doesn't make any sense. Unless you know that the tradition was that at the end of teaching your Talmudim an incredible lesson, you would feast. And the tradition even says that if the, your lesson or your tractate that you're teaching ends on the 14th of Nisan, on the 14th of Aviv, you don't have to fast. You can have a feast. And so could it possibly be that our Lord, who had taught His disciples for three and a half years, 
finished the tractate completely, and this was a celebration of Seudat Mitzvah. This was a celebration of you passed the test. I have nothing else to teach you. And could it also be that that night he says, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to drink. Until what? Until he comes back. Could it be that there's a, a message there that he was actually fasting for the firstborn? He was the firstborn and he was about to redeem Adam. We'll go into that in the next section next week. But let's get into Exodus chapter 12. And I'm just going to read this for you real quick. You can follow along if you have your Bibles. Exodus chapter 12. Oh, I'm already there. Now Yahweh said to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. So basically one lamb per ten people. Your lamb has to be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from any sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month, and then you shall, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel to kill it at twilight, okay? You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly shall kill it at twilight. I'm going to explain what that means. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh the same night, roasted with fire, and shall eat it in unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. You shall not leave any of it. Listen, this is key to understanding something that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Until morning. You shall not let any of it stand until morning. By morning, by the moment that the day breaks, that lamb has to be fully consumed. But whatever is left of it in the morning, you shall burn with fire. You shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And lastly, in verse 14, now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout all your generations, you are to celebrate it as a temporary ordinance. As a permanent ordinance. Just kidding, but see, this is how we live our lives. We literally, the enemy in the garden, God said, don't eat from that tree. And the enemy said, God didn't really mean what he said. The father said, I want you to take this and it wants to be generation after generation to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. And somehow we believe that he was just kidding. Permanent is permanent. Take a permanent marker, put it on your wall, put it on your clothes. And then tell your children, oh, don't worry, it'll come out. It's just temporary. Not at all. Even children know it's permanent. That's why they do it. (laughs) I'm convinced they do it just to see the look on our faces. So that's the story of Passover. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the same. Exodus 12, verse 15 says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and from the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from all of your houses from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall, be, shall perish from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. That means we're going to have a meeting. Okay? It means that all the children of Israel came together. And on the seventh day, there should be a holy convocation, which is a Sabbath, by the way. That's the definition of Shabbat. To you, no manner of work shall be done in them, except that which man must eat. That only he may be prepared by you. 
So in the story of the Exodus and in the story and in the, in the details of Passover and unleavened bread, here's what we've got so far. They chose an unblemished lamb on the 10th of the first month. Okay, So on Nisan 10, uh, which is the modern account, but it was originally called Aviv because the uh, barley would be Aviv or ripened. Okay, So on the 10th of Aviv, they would choose the unblemished lamb and parade it through the streets in Jerusalem. They inspected it for four days. Four days they inspected it. The high priest would deem it clean, and they sacrificed it on the 14th between the evenings. I'm going to explain what between the evenings mean. It's really between 3 and 6 p.m., but I'll give you a graphic here to show it in just a minute. And then they put the blood on their doorposts. So now we're going to get into the timeline. We're going to find out exactly when Yeshua died. What is this between the evening thing? We're going to get into some of the statistics and the math. Find out how it lines up. The entire feast of unleavened bread starts in the evening of the 14th, which begins the 15th and goes until sundown the 21st. So it's 15th to the 21st. The first day, the 15th, and the seventh day, the 21st, are high Sabbaths. Okay, that's important. So here's what it looks like. You shall keep it till the 14th day of the same month, then at the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it between the evenings. So on the black, on the left-hand side, is the 14th, the, the night of the 14th. So the night of the 14th, and then you have the 14th day. And then you have the beginning of the 15th starts in the evening. Because remember, biblical days start in the evening. So it goes evening to evening, and then there was one day, and God said it was good. So that's how it works. So the 14th in Roman time starts at 12 a.m. at midnight, and that's kind of close, but it backs up until sunset on the biblical time period, okay? And so the night of the 14th starts the 14th. You go through the entire 14th, and when you get to noon, okay, that's what they call the first setting, all right? So the first setting of the sun started at noon, The second setting of the sun was when it actually went down, which makes logical sense. The sun starts to go down, and they call that the sun is setting, the first setting. So that's why it says between the settings. It's a first century understood idiomatic expression that meant between noon 01 and 6 p.m. when the sun went down, that's called between the settings. And that's why he was he was uh, sacrificed between the settings at three o'clock. And this feast, the first century historian Philo says this, and this feast is begun on the 15th day of the month, in the middle of the month, on the day on which the moon is full of light, in consequence of the providence of God taking care that there shall be no darkness on that day. Now, just so you know that I, I put this in here for one purpose, to show that there was tremendous spirituality in the first century, even among those that weren't really followers of Yeshua. They're even looking for, for connections in the Bible, and they were connecting. These weren't just obligatory feasts. I mean, they were connecting things, and they connected the idea that, wow, God must have chosen a full moon because He didn't want a single person to have darkness during this time. He wanted this to be a time of celebration. Josephus says this, So these high priests, upon the coming of that feast, which is called the Passover, when they slay their sacrifices from the ninth hour to the eleventh, but so that a company not less than ten belonging to every sacrifice. So we're just giving you a little bit of a historical context here that these things were done. In Matthew 27, 46, it says this, And about the ninth hour... Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So does he die? We're going to get into which day he's going to die on now. Does he die on Wednesday the 14th, Thursday the 15th, or the traditional Friday? Let's discover the answers. First of all, you have to understand inclusive reasoning that much of the Bible's numbers come from what's called inclusive reckoning. Excuse me, inclusive reckoning. Inclusive reckoning is this. I'm going to give you an example where God actually counts by inclusive reckoning. Much of the debate on when Yeshua died is based on whether the numbers should be inclusive 
or should they be exclusive reckoning? And I'll explain both in just a second. Exodus 19.16 is a great example of inclusive reckoning. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Okay? So look at this. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain. God, before this, He actually says, Today and tomorrow and on the third day. And so the day that God actually speaks it, He counts it as a day, even though it could be just a couple hours before the sun goes down. Does that make sense? Just like we would say that today and tomorrow. The third day is actually the day after tomorrow in English because it counts a day, tomorrow, and then the third day. And we see this continually. We also see this in Jonah. Also uses inclusive reckoning. When he's found three days and three nights in the belly of a whale, And the night that he's sleeping in the middle of the night is counted as one of the nights. So if exclusive reckoning would not count that day. So if I said, hey, let's meet up in two days. And inclusive reckoning would mean I'm counting today and I'm counting tomorrow. So I want to meet you at tomorrow, at the end of tomorrow. If inclusive reckoning is the way that we we talk. In American, we don't do inclusive reckoning. We do exclusive reckoning. So we don't almost ever count today when we're actually counting. Is anyone confused yet? (laughs) Basically, bottom line is this. In America, in Western Roman thinking, we don't count the day that we're talking about. But in in first century Hebrew times, they always counted the the day that that they were speaking of it. So that they said three days, it counted the day that they said it as one day, and that was part of the three days. We're in America. If I said, meet me in two days, I would not be meeting tomorrow. I'd be meeting the next day. But back then, that's not how it worked. Let's find out if Wednesday is the day that Yeshua died. Mark chapter 16, verse 9 says this, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Okay? So we got to figure out what this word early means because this is really, really important. Because Mark chapter 16 verse 9 says this, he says he rose early on the first day of the week. The first day of the week in Gregorian calendar is Sunday. It says he rose early. So we better find out what that word means. And if you look at the word early, it means at dawn. That's what it means. It's in the morning, early in the morning, the fourth watch of the night between 3 o'clock and 6 a.m. in the morning. That's the fourth watch. That's the Greek word that's used here to mean early. I know that in, uh, in a lot of Messianic circles, they really, really, really want, and I was one of them at one time, really wanted Messiah to raise from the dead right at the closing out of Shabbat, going into the first day of the week, and I wanted the word early to mean that early. But you can't take the Greek word which means at dawn and put it at the, between the evenings. You can't put it at sundown because that's not what it means. The word literally means at first break of light. Well, when the sun is going down, that's not the first break of light. Okay, And so there's no way that uh, we can have Yeshua raising from the dead in the middle of the night, we can't have him raising from the dead right when the sun goes down on Saturday. He has to raise from the dead exactly the way the disciples used the right word for, which is in English they would have said, now he rose right before dawn. And I would imagine it would have been probably right crack to the millisecond as the sun was coming up prophetically in Jerusalem. The sun is coming up in Jerusalem. Wednesday. Here we go. Let's keep going on this and see if we can discover something else. Luke chapter 24, verse 21. On the road to Emmaus. Remember, he appears to a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus. But we were hoping that it was he that was going to redeem Israel in this conversation that they're having. Indeed, besides all of this, today is the third day since these things happen. So if we have a Wednesday crucifixion, we have a big problem with Luke chapter 24, verse 21, because the disciples are saying it's the third day since these things happen. 
So if you have Wednesday, you've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's five days. Even if you don't use inclusive, it's four. There's, it's impossible to have this scripture line up with a Wednesday crucifixion because even if you don't choose uh, Wednesday uh, inclusively and you only count Thursday and Friday and Saturday and the day that they're doing it, it's still four days. These are the two rules. We, got, we have to line up with Luke chapter 24, verse 21, that it's been three days, or this is the third day since these things happened. And Matthew 12, 40 says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we've got to get three days and three nights and it's, when the disciples on the road to Emmaus say it's been three days since this happened, these are our two major rules that we, have to, we, have to, we can't break. If we break one of these, these rules, then this, these particular scriptures uh, don't work. And we know that they're the truth. So here we go. On a chart, Wednesday. If it's Wednesday, we've got four days and four nights inclusive, or three days and four nights inclusive exclusive reckoning. So on Wednesday, if he dies on Wednesday, we count Wednesday, we count all day Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that's four days, and then nights, we count Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night, because we know he rose fourth watch on Saturday. So that's four days and four nights, if you use the traditional biblical time uh, of inclusive reckoning. If you don't use inclusive and you use exclusive, which is not normal in the Bible, then you have, you don't count Wednesday. You count Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, so you do get three days, but you have to count Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. And so we break the Jonah rule of three days and three nights, no matter how you do it on Wednesday. So if, Forget about all, for those of you Bible students out there, forget about all the scriptures that are you trying to figure it out. It's got to break. It cannot break those two rules. You don't have to look at Wednesday any further because we've got four nights. No matter how you do it, there's four nights because he rose from the grave Sunday morning. The people that say that he uh, died on Wednesday are the proponents, and I used to be one of them actually, uh, have the Messiah raising, the only way to do it is have him raising Saturday night so it doesn't go through the night. But we know that breaks the scripture of him rising at dawn, along with all kinds of, of prophetic uh, uh, shadows that I'm going to show you a little bit later. Also, by the way, the only year with a Wednesday of Eve, and we get this off of NASA's website, with a 14th of Eve or a full moon, is 27 AD, which puts his birth at 6 BC, which is impossible. Okay, because this date is far too early and it's impossible based on new evidence of a 1 BC death of Herod and John the Baptist going into ministry in 29 AD. Okay, and I'm not going to go into all the details on that, but I can because I could spend 20 minutes, uh, you know, proving that. But basically, there's new scholastic academic evidence out that Herod died 1 BC. All right, and with John, we know for a fact that his ministry started 29 A.D. or right about that time because we have historical uh, documents to prove that. And uh, when uh, Tiberius came in and so on and so forth, so there's no way for Yeshua to be born 6 B.C., which automatically puts out a Wednesday uh, crucifixion because the, just the flat out the, the numbers don't work. So now let's move to Friday and find out the traditional Friday. Believe it or not. Most of Christianity, Catholic or not, believes that he died on a Friday because we adopted this right from our Catholic predecessors. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, again, there's our rule. It's got to be three days and three nights. We've got to have three days and three nights, and it's got to be three days since these things happen. So let's find out. You get to the calendar. If he dies on a Friday using inclusive reckoning, count with me, Friday... And Saturday, that's it. You can only get two days. You can't count Sunday. The Catholics will count Sunday inclusively, but you can't count Sunday for three days and three nights in the grave. Why? Because he rose before the day break. Okay? So you can't count even a second of it because it says he rose before the day break. They got there. Mary gets there before the sun comes up. He's already gone. Okay? Okay? Because he rose right at dawn, right before dawn. If you, if you count that, so you got Friday and Saturday, you get two days. 
Now let's count the nights, Friday night and Saturday night. There's just no way to get three days and three nights from a Friday crucifixion. So I know that uh, giving grace, most of us didn't think of these things growing up. We just, you know, thought of, uh, you know, died on Friday. But it's embarrassing, if you agree with me, in front of an atheist that we can't even count to three. And they want, they, we want them to believe in our God and when we can't even count to three. So why are all these things important? It's important because, folks, this, our entire salvation is built off of Yeshua and Him dying on the cross. We need to understand the basic 101s that they understood. What's embarrassing is that we even have to teach this, what was already understood in the Scriptures. So here we go. I pulled this off of NASA's website. 27 A.D., was April 9th. That's a Wednesday. 28 AD was a Monday. So in other words, the 14th of Aviv is a, when, the, when the Passover lamb uh, was given was a Monday. That doesn't work. On the 29th, 29 AD, it was a Sunday. On 30, it was a Thursday. On 31, it was a Sunday. On 32, it was a Monday. On 33, it was a Friday. Okay? You can't go to 33. That's impossible because it breaks all of the other rules of math of when people were born and when Herod died and so on and so forth. John the Baptist went in the ministry. The only one that works is 30 A.D. when he dies on Thursday. But we're going to look on 33 A.D. is the only one for a Friday. So if people believe in a Friday crucifixion, they have to go to 33 AD. Praise God for NASA that has done their astrological homework because this automatically eliminates Friday. It can't be 33 AD because of the math. And many people would love it to be 33 AD because Yeshua was 33 years old, but the truth is is he could not have been born at 0 or 1 BC or 1 AD. It just doesn't work out. And again, I don't have time to go through all of that, and that's not my point. But my point is just to show uh, the mathematical impossibility of having a crucifixion on a Friday. So the problem is that 33 AD is far too late and puts the birth after the death of Herod. We know that Herod is alive during the birth of Yeshua because he's the one that calls to kill all the kids under the year, year of two, uh, two years of age and younger. And younger. So he's got to be alive. Herod would already be dead by 33 AD. AD, if there was a 33 AD crucifixion. So let's go to Thursday and discover if this is the most logical choice. Again, three days and three nights is rule number one, and it's got to be at least three days on the road to Emmaus. So let's do the math. If he dies on Thursday, and we use inclusive reckoning, Thursday is a day, Friday is a day, Shabbat is a day, that's three days. Let's count the nights. Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. No matter how you do it, it's three days and three nights. It's real, it's real simple. We, I, there's article after article after article of which day did he die, which day did he die. The only day he could have possibly died is on a Thursday. And ladies and gentlemen, go figure that April 6, 30 AD on NASA's website, Nissan 14 is a Thursday. So we take April 6th, and I went to onlineconversion.com to figure out which day it was because I just said April 6th. I I don't know what day April 6th is. So I go to onlineconversion.com, convert it to Julian, and it comes out to Thursday. Thursday is the day on 30 AD of a full moon. And Thursday is the only day mathematically on a calendar that you can get three days and three nights. And amazingly, all of the other dates line up perfectly when you backdate it to his birth, it works out beautifully. 30 AD, April 6th, on Thursday was when the Messiah died. I think it's amazing that today with technology we can actually know the day and the hour that our Messiah died. A Thursday crucifixion puts Aviv 10 on the traditional Palm Sunday. We got that right. It was Palm Sunday. Whereas Wednesday would put it on a Sabbath, which wouldn't have happened. They would not have traveled 15 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Can't happen. It's not happening. If you read the Scriptures, that travel from Jericho to Jerusalem is 15 miles. They're not going to waltz into Jerusalem on the Shabbat after doing 15 miles. They're not even allowed to travel more than two miles on the Shabbat in the first century. So a Wednesday crucifixion by multiple counts 
breaks the scriptures. Exodus 19, 16, I love the prophetic significance of him rising Sunday morning. Then it came to pass on the third day, check this out, in the morning, that there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Ladies and gentlemen, the first time God reveals himself to his people is on the third day in the morning. I think that's pretty cool. And it gives us a foreshadowing, a picture of what the Messiah is going to look like. That on the third day, the Messiah is going to reveal Himself. God's going to reveal Himself again in the morning. How about Sunday morning service here? I did that. I should have put it in quotes because Leviticus 23.10. Speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, When you come into the land which I give you, you shall reap the harvest, therefore, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits to your harvest unto the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Shabbat, the priest shall wave it. What is this all saying? After Passover, three days later in the first century, was Shabbat, was the first day. At dawn, the high priest is taking the, the sheaves of wheat that he bound together, and he's waving it before the Lord. Sunday morning at dawn, they're praising God for the first harvest, the first fruits, and asking the Lord for a great harvest in the fall. At the same moment, Yeshua is rising from the dead as the first fruits offering and asking God to give a great harvest in the fall. Does anybody find that interesting? I think it's amazing. And the commandment was given 1,200 years before Yeshua even showed up. So the most probable date to end this section is Thursday, April 6, 30 AD at approximately 3 p.m. Let's go through a couple difficult passages. Matthew 26, 17 now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yeshua, saying unto him, Where are we going to prepare you to eat the Passover? That seems to be a difficult scripture because it's saying on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's in English. And they use the wrong word in English and it really messes things up because the word there is before the day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It could not have been on the first day of Unleavened Bread because they would have already eaten the Passover the night before. Because you don't eat the Passover on the first day of Unleavened Bread. That is a high Sabbath. Okay, everyone rest. The Passover is simply a meal that happens the night before the first day of Unleavened Bread. So even logically, they're not talking about the first day of Unleavened Bread, but the Greek word there, protos, can mean before the day of Unleavened Bread. So they just goofed, because it, it can mean first, but context tells you if it means before or if it means first, okay? Because the first can be, the first one is before everybody else, so that's why it can mean both. And in this context, it should have been now before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which makes a lot more sense. Mark chapter 14, verse 12, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There you go again. When it's customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb. It's not customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb on the first day of Unleavened Bread. It's before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Where do you want to go and make preparations to get the Passover? Now, you also have to understand a little bit of context here. When they say, where do you want us to prepare to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? They're not talking about just the Passover night. That is not at all the way it worked. In our Western society, we get the idea that, you know, hey, I want to prepare a meal. No. The upper room was a preparation for the whole week. They never left. They literally, uh, as you're going to see in our Passover Seder uh, tomorrow, they would recline at the table, they would eat, then they would fall asleep, get right back up, and just like uh, we do here in America, on a late night part, we just start eating again. That's what they did. That's why they called it a feast. It was a long feast. They didn't do it for a night. This was an entire week. So the preparation was not necessarily for the Passover itself. It was for the entire week. 
Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day into the seventh day, the soul shall be cut off from Israel. So this was really important for them to get the leaven out of their house. God was already giving us shadows and giving us uh, pictures of what we should be doing. So now I want to show you the gospel in Torah. We're almost finished, but I want to show you the gospel written in the Torah. It's so amazing, all the things that revolve around the Feast of Passover that we can discover. And I've taught on this before, but the cleansing of the leper is one of the most beautiful pictures in the Torah of the gospel. This is why Passover is all about the gospel, why the feast days are all about the gospel. It's all about Yeshua. It's all about Jesus. And we can see a beautiful picture here. Leviticus chapter 14, it says, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of the cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then the priest commands to take before him, that is to be cleansed, two birds alive and clean, and cedarwood, scarlet, and hyssop. Whenever you see cedarwood, scarlet, and hyssop, scarlet and hyssop, you immediately should be thinking of the Messiah, the death, burial, and resurrection, and start looking for connections, and that's exactly what we see here. Because it says that, as for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them in the living bird, and the living bird, in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And they shall sprinkle upon him, that is, to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall go pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into open field. And I know it sounds extremely cryptic, but the reality is that both birds are there. And the short story is this, because I have a long teaching on this, that Yeshua is a bird. We are a bird. They're identical birds. Yeshua, when he was baptized, what came out? A dove came out. The Holy Spirit is representational of a dove or a bird. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And so you are representational of that same exact bird, which is why he chooses two doves here. So he's got two birds identical. Neither one know which one is going to die, but one is going to die and one is going to be set free. So the one that dies, the blood goes into running water. The other one is wrapped in scarlet, hyssop, and cedar wood, dipped into the other blood, uh, blood of the other bird, and then set free. This is why in the Gospels it says that you must be dipped. You must be baptized, is the word actually in Greek. Baptizmo, you must be immersed into the blood of Yeshua, and only then will you be set free. You must be wrapped in the same scarlet robe that he was wrapped in. The same hyssop that was, he was given with the gall and vinegar that he refused. And the cedar wood. All of that. The picture of the Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection. That's in the cleansing of the leper. We are all lepers. God giving us a picture of the gospel in the Torah itself. The connection is beautiful. John 19, 34. Instead of one of the soldiers... Pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. This isn't some witchcraft thing that God is doing. He's giving the most beautiful prophetic picture of the gospel. This is why the water had to be there. Because what was going to come out of his side was what? Blood and water. What are we dipped in but the blood and water of Messiah? This is why he says that you must be baptized in water and water and in fire, but it wasn't just water because another scripture talks about being baptized in his blood. It's referring back to the cleansing of the leper. We are put outside of the garden, the same way that a leper, when he has leprosy, the high priest puts him outside of Jerusalem. He can never come back into the garden, never come back into Jerusalem until the high priest declares him clean. And how is he declared clean? Not just because he waltzes up and says, here I is, I'm clean, I don't have leprosy anymore. The high priest inspects him and then goes through this ceremony, giving us the picture of the Messiah. There must be a death. One bird must be sacrificed for another. Yeshua was sacrificed so that we could be set free. And there's the hyssop right here. A jar of, of wine and vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to his lips. They stripped him and put on the scarlet robe. So there's your, 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 all, all three out of the four. You have the hyssop, you have the scarlet, and you have the scarlet robe, the hyssop, and the blood and the water right there. The only thing we're missing is the cedar, and it's the only thing that we don't know what he was crucified on. And I suggest that that cedar beam, uh, that, he was, that beam that he was carrying was made out of cedar, which is, it's Roman. It's what it would have been made out of. 
And that's why he has cedar. That's why he doesn't choose applewood. He chooses cedar in all of those prophetic significance. Let's go to another one real quickly. This one's amazing. I have a whole teaching on the red heifer. If you have not seen it, I encourage you to get it. It really, it will blow your mind. It's my favorite. How many have seen the red heifer teaching? It's amazing all the prophetic connections that God put in there. Number one, the red heifer had to be perfect. You could, you could not have a ceremony, ceremonial service. You could not have a sacrificial system without the red heifer. The red heifer sacrifice is what started and made the entire temple clean so that they could start sacrifices. So when the temple was destroyed and a new temple was built, there had to be a kosher, perfect red heifer sacrifice first to cleanse everything and all the priests so they could begin their work. Priests could not be inaugurated unless there was a red heifer sacrifice. It had to be perfect without blemish. It must be purchased by the temple treasury. How many know that it was the temple from the temple treasury is where Judas got his money? Number three had to be inspected by the high priest before the sacrifice, which is why Yeshua was taken into to Caiaphas' place in the middle of the night. Because according to the law of God, the red heifer sacrifice had to be inspected by the high priest first. They couldn't have crucified him without doing it. They'd have broke the law of God. They were keeping the law of God and didn't even know it. The curtain must be opened during the sacrifice. The sacrifice happened outside of Jerusalem, and they had to open the curtain when they did the sacrifice. It's the only one they did this. Why do you think when Yeshua died that the curtain was ripped? We say, oh, because, you know, he was just giving us access to the Holy of Holies. That too, but there was a law that was being kept right here because he was about to be the first one to inaugurate all of the priests to go into business. That sacrifice had to be made and the curtain had to be opened according to the law. Scarlet, cedar, and hyssop are thrown into the fire on top of the red heifer. Wonder why. It's kind of weird. Imagine being the priest going, why did Yahweh tell us to take scarlet, hyssop, and wrap it all over cedar wood? And put, uh, this makes no sense. It's because there's a prophetic significance that he's foreshadowing and foretelling the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. The ashes are putting away, get what? Inside of a newly hewn stone. They were literally put in a tomb, a small tomb that was made out of brand, that was brand new hewn, uh, hewn stone. What was Yeshua put in? A brand new hewn stone grave of Joseph of Arimathea. And you know what? The ashes are also mixed with water and are sprinkled on the third and the seventh day. Amazingly, what happens to Yeshua? He sprinkles us on the third day, the end of the third day, and he will sprinkle us again at the end of the seventh day, and the end of the seventh millennium, because a priest cannot go into business, uh, if you will, into service until after the seventh day is over and the beginning of the eighth day. And that's why the sprinkling is, I believe, prophetic of the third and the seventh millenniums. At the end of the third millennium, at the end of the seventh millennium. The red heifer sacrifice also was done outside of Jerusalem. One of the only sacrifices, period, that happened outside of Jerusalem that did not happen on the altar. It happened outside of the city on the Mount of Olives. And they built a bridge specifically only for that time period, the seven times that they did this in history, they would build this bridge across the Kidron Valley because the priests could not be uh, uh, unclean by walking through grave sites, which are all around that entire valley. Where does Yeshua come back? Right where he was crucified. Right at the place where the red heifer sacrifice was, was, was made. Right there is where he comes down on the Mount of Olives and splits it into two. There's so many things. Genesis 22, 4, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw, saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go, boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. He's coming back and it's all on the third day. If you look for it, the gospel of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua the Messiah, is everywhere. It's almost in every single story. I'm just giving you a few. It's in the butler and the baker. 
Yet within three days, in Genesis 40, verse 13, it says, Shall Pharaoh lift up thy head and restore you into your place, and you shall deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when you were his butler. What do you have in that story? You have the, the baker with the, with the bread, and you have the butler, the baker and the butler with the wine. You have the, literally the bread and the wine three days. He's going to restore your position. Same story of the gospel. Within three days, bread and wine. The sign of David, one of, one of the most uh, obscure pictures of Jesus, of Yeshua in the Torah or in the Tanakh is this. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 11. It says, They found an Egyptian in the field, brought him to David, and gave him bread. And he did eat, and they made him drink water. They gave him a piece of cake of figs, two clusters of raisins, and when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And if you know anything about this story, it's incredible. This story, they, after three days and three nights, he comes back to life. They thought he was dead. And after they revive him three days and three nights, he comes back to life on the third day. And it's him that leads them to the enemy and they defeat the enemy. He becomes, in Hebrew, a Mashiach, a savior to the Israelites, to David. The stories are everywhere, three days and three nights. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time that we go back to the beginning. Would you agree? When we get past Jesus and him crucified, like Hebrews chapter 6 says, we will discover the depths of God's word. We will discover not just the Passover. The Passover was literally a meal. It was literally the one night where they, the, the lambs were, were, were crucified, if you will, and every family celebrated that in memorial of leaving Egypt. But Yeshua changed everything. He wasn't going to be there the next day, and he knew that. So he said, every single time that you get together, this is what I want you to do now. I want you to take this bread and remember that it's my body and remember me. No longer do I want you to celebrate Passover in remembrance of leaving Egypt. I want you to remember it, that you're leaving the Egypt. I am the one that's taking you out of sin and into life. I want you to take this whole thing and remind yourselves of me. Every time, not just on Passover, when he says, do this in remembrance of me, he's not saying that we should only keep you know, communion on Passover. Not at all. The Gospels and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, are riddled with examples where even Yeshua himself, when he came back from the dead, shows up with them on the road of Emmaus. What's he do? First thing he does, he has dinner with them, and he stands up and he takes the bread and said, and he blesses the bread, praise before, by the way, and he blesses the bread and he says, I give this bread Bless this, and I give it to you. He did the same thing at the Last Supper, which is how they recognized him and immediately disappeared. What, why did he do that? He just told them a few days ago, do this in remembrance of me. It wasn't Passover. It was a regular meal. Every single time that we break bread with one another, and I could go on, there's a half a dozen examples of how they broke bread. And by the way, the bread that was used on that Last Supper was leavened bread. It was a loaf of bread. It could not have been unleavened bread. Do you know why? Because there was a law in the first century that you could not eat unleavened bread before unleavened bread. Isn't that a shock? Do you know why? Because they wanted it to be kadosh. They wanted the Feast of Unleavened Bread to mean something. So when it got close to the feast, you were not allowed to eat unleavened bread because it was an anticipatory atmosphere. They wanted you to eat all the leavened bread that you possibly can. This day is set apart. Yeshua would not have eaten unleavened bread the day before unleavened bread and break the law right there. He wouldn't do it. He wanted to make it set apart. And he was giving us precedent that every single time that you guys get together, and by the way, in my research, I, I found something that was quite funny. There are some things that never change. Do you know that it was after the synagogue service on Shabbat where they all went out to dinner? It's there. It's in history. This is when they did it. When do we all go out to dinner? 
When do most Christians go out to dinner? After church. And this is exactly what they did in the first century was late in the night after the, the service was over, they would break bread. Not crackers. They broke real bread. And they ate with one another. And every time that they did that, Yeshua said, I want you to remember me. Every time you break bread and, and drink wine, which was every night. I mean, this, it's not like they had Coke products, you know? I mean, there wasn't a whole lot to choose from. Every time you drink a glass of wine and every time that you break bread, I want you to remember that I died so that you could be set free and do this. He doesn't want us to just remember him once a year. Does it take away from the fact that we should do definitely, extraordinarily remember him once a year during Pesach? Absolutely. But every time we break bread together, I want you to remember this. Every Shabbat, teach your children well. This is about the life and death of Yeshua giving us provision again, life in our lungs once a week. Amen? Stand with me. As we close out this service, I want you to remember that not only did God send His only Son for you, but that He expects something from you. You see, these feast days are not just about us feasting together. It's not just about Mishpachah. It's not just about the family. It's not just about unity. There is something to do during these feast days. These are rehearsals for something. They're supposed to point us to things. You see, we've all been robbed of our heritage. We've all been told by our parents it's not about the Easter eggs. It's not about the presents. It's not about the chocolate bunny. You could have fooled me when I was five. I, my parents still have a video of an Easter egg hunt that I did, and it was everybody lined up, you know. And all the kids are going, when they say go, and they're all picking up their Easter eggs. No, little Jimmy Staley is running 150 miles an hour to the farthest point because he's convinced that golden egg is at the end of the property, right? Nobody could have convinced me that Easter wasn't about Easter eggs or candy. But when we do Bible things in Bible ways, we don't have to tell our kids that. We just simply lay the truth before them and let them be saturated in the depth of God's Word. We've lost so much of our heritage. We've lost the Lord's feasts. And I declare it's time that we get them back. It's time that we take our heritage back. It's time that we take our inheritance back. It's time that we start doing Bible things in Bible ways and starting out small and learning these things. I know we can't turn a train around overnight. And if you're watching this for the very first time, I encourage you, don't try to turn it around overnight unless God absolutely tells you to do so. You can wreck a train if you try to turn it on a dime because most of you are, there are a lot of people following you. You stop a train first. You explain to the passengers what you need to do and then you start laying new tracks to turn it around and you can take a whole congregation with you in the process. To make this on a personal level, every single one of us, some of you say, well, you know, I don't want to celebrate Easter anymore but you're still struggling in your life. Did you know Passover is all about freedom? Some of you feel like you're in bondage. Maybe you are. Let me tell you, tell you a, a, a formula for an answer for, for whoever that is that's out there that doesn't feel free. There's only two things it can be. So praise God, it's only two we have to choose from. Number one, you're in sin. And you're in sin in your own bondage and you don't know it. And you don't have the humility to even ask anyone. Or number two, God, you're not in sin and he's training you. Oh yeah, and there is a third version. You're in sin and he's training you. Either way, we need to submit to what God is doing. We are not made, ladies and gentlemen, to make bricks. We're made to be free. So, Father, I ask right now, at the beginning of this feast, that you would teach us freedom. And, Lord, that's even strange to say, to teach us freedom. Because it seems more logical to say, set us free. 
as if you do all the work. But God, freedom all the way back to Exodus, all the way back to the time when the Israelites became free, you required them to do something. A sacrifice had to be made. They had to obey you. Death of themselves had to happen. They had to put aside what they thought. They had to obey you, and then they were saved. Then freedom came. They had to humble themselves. Father, I pray that you would humble your people. God, there are people that are listening to this message for the first time, and they're offended because they think that uh, you're taking away something from them. Father, show them that you're taking away the dollar bill in their hand to replace it with the keys to the bank. Yes, it's hard when you take something out of someone's hand. The faith is, are we going to obey God and trust Him that He has everything that we could ever want, desire, or need when we trust Him and do things His way? So, Father, I'm trusting that you're going to speak to the hearts of your people tonight all across the globe. And that, Lord, that you would call your people to repent and return to you and begin to do what you say so that your, your infinite inheritance and blessings can flow once again. Turn the water on, O oh God. Saturate your people. Bless them. We are not the tail. We are the head according to your word. Let us stop acting like we're the tail. Father, I pray for anybody out there tonight that's struggling and hurting that this would be a moment they would be challenged to get the leaven out of their life and do whatever it takes to do it because the 10th plague is coming again. It will come again. And it may be for some tonight. So with all heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to give the opportunity on this most incredible beginning of this weekend. That if you said, Pastor Jim, I don't, I don't know right now, man, if I, if I went home and on my way home I got in a car accident and I died, I, I don't know if I would spend eternity with my king. I don't even know if I know this king, Yeshua. I don't know if, where I would spend my eternity. I, I didn't take the blood and put it on the doorposts of my heart. But I want, to get, I want to get it settled. I want to know for sure. If you'd say, you know, I, I don't think I'm saved. I want to know Yeshua. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and say, man, I, just to, for me to pray for you, and I absolutely will. And so if there's anyone... I raise it real high. I see some hands, but I want to make sure. Thank you. Anybody else? You say, I just I want to know for sure. Get it settled. Why wait? Eternity is forever. It's a long time. The Bible says if you are ashamed before man, he will be ashamed before you'll be ashamed of you when you stand before him. Everybody in here that's around you loves the Lord God and will celebrate. If you're online tonight and you don't know Yeshua the Master, tonight is your night. You can give your life to Him and put the blood on your heart because there will come a day when the death angel will come again. Last chance. Five, four, three, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask those three people to come down over here and, uh, and let's just get this settled and we'll pray with you. We'll give you some instructions. Okay? So, ma'am, if you want to come on down, you want to come on down, please, and, and we will pray with you. And if, David, if you could just meet them over there as they come down. 
Yeah, thank you. Don't worry about it. Who cares what your spouse thinks or what anybody thinks? It's, it's time to get it worked out. Need a couple more prayer leaders, please. Give them a hand for being courageous. God cares about the one sheep that's gone astray, amen. I just feel right now that we just need to pray for our friends and family that don't know Him. Can we do that? Father, we just pray for those that don't know You. That we love. Father, we ask that You remove the blinders from their eyes. Pray You draw them closer to You. Pray this will be the year, Lord the return of the exiles of Israel. Let this be the year, Father, that your name is bannered in the earth realm. Father, we love you, and we thank you for how great you are. Take us, God, where we need to be this Passover season. Remove all the leaven from our life, and let us be pure and chaste bride, unstained, unleavened by the world. In Yeshua's name, everybody said, amen. All right.